Welcome to the Bluegrass Podcast. Today we are talking with Judy Nelson of Soul Spirit Farms about her farm, their wonderful new Burmese mimosa they've been working on, and the hospitality that they offer, educating individuals on cannabis and natural farming. We are so excited to have you with us today, and we hope that you're having a clean, heavy, and happy harvest wherever you are, and whatever you've been bringing in this fall. Let's get right to it. Absolutely. So how's your harvest been going? You know, we just finished like yesterday, pretty much. So that's exciting. And, uh, you know, it went really well this year. We had fires that, um, you know, blocked out the sun for a few weeks. And so we had a little bit of like a, you know, battle with just dealing with that and um but luckily the timing was okay to where nothing was at risk of getting smoky tasting or anything like that so i would say we dodged a bullet there Mm -hmm. and was that the six rivers fire that was earlier this summer yeah so there was there was actually the six rivers complex on one side of us and then the ammon fire on the other side Eventually, I think they kind of came together and they sort of called them one thing. But but yeah, we were we were surrounded yet again because we were last year, too. So it's been that's been, you know, stressful, I would say, to just be like, really, is this going to be every year now? Because it's not fun. Absolutely. So what was your favorite thing you pulled in from your harvest? Like just for you personally, what were you most excited about? Oh my God, I'm so glad you asked that because I am so excited about this Burmese mimosa. It's mm-hmm. my favorite weed ever. And we've never pulled it off commercially. We've been doing like a pheno hunt for the past three years on it. And, um, you know, we just, we have a small batch of it this year, like a tiny little 10 pound batch, but it's so good. It's so good. Give us the lowdown. So what does it smell like? What does it taste like? What what gets you excited about it? Well, I like fruity weed Mm -hmm. and I'm not a gassy or savory weed fan. And so this is, um, it's, so it's, uh, orange Burmese crossed with rose mimosa. And Mm -hmm. so it's this like really grapefruity, sweet floral thing. And then it's got like a little kind of woodiness behind it. So it's got like almost that like amber or, um, you know, like I want to say resinous, not Mm -hmm. meaning like resin from the cannabis plant, but like, you know, any of those like incense-y kind of um, resins that we use for for that kind of thing it's got like just this enough of that in there that it's just also has a little bit of earth in it so it's so good and you can smell it from across the I mean that smells terrific I'm completely down for that oh right so you know I was just saying that it's gonna be kind of interesting to see see how it goes in the market because Mm -hmm. you know it's only I think we you know we are indeed it between like 18 and 20 percent THC um you know and so it's like Mm -hmm. to me I'm like I am very oh yeah just I'm just hoping that that I can get people to smell it and taste it you know because once I can do that I know that everybody is gonna love this but you know well, and hopefully we'll see more of it too. Like, just because like you're talking about, you can't tell from that percentage and that one in particular, what it might do for you too. There's stuff in the 15 to 20 range that'll knock your socks off in terms of the high. Exactly. Exactly. So hopefully people will, you know, get out of their own ways on that and and make it so that they don't miss out on this amazing weed because they're just looking for the highest THC percentage. And where can they pick it up if they were looking to pick it up? Well, it it isn't anywhere yet because it's actually still curing, but you know, hope our our best um, you know, like any small independent retailer in California, um, 
Sespe Creek in Ojai is definitely one of our absolute biggest supporters. Cornerstone mm -hmm. in LA, um, Tory Holistics and California Holistics down in the San Diego area. Um, up here locally in Humboldt, hopefully Urban Market will have it and Heart of the Emerald and um, maybe Soulful in Sebastopol. You never know what they're going to pick up, but I'm hoping mm -hmm. they'll take some of it. So. I definitely look forward to picking up an eighth of it. It sounds terrific. It's so good. So, and in kind of asking you about that, you know, different places that sell your cannabis, you all don't just farm. You also have a really interesting tourism tie-in. We do. Do you yeah. want to talk about that a little bit? Because I think I, that that's one of the really interesting things about your all's farm in particular. Yes, I would love to talk about that. So we um, have a glamping experience that we offer to people in the summers. So I'm I'm closed down now and I will likely open Memorial Day weekend in 2023. Mm -hmm. um, and there we have um, bell tents. So there are these lovely, fun um, canvas tents with real beds and comfy linens. And every tent has a separate bath house, you know, nobody shares a bathroom with strangers, which I think mm -hmm. is important. Um, and they all have hot running water. So it's, it's glamping, right? It's glamorous camping. Um, mm -hmm. You are definitely still outside, but it's, it's pretty, pretty luxurious. And um, I either I cook organic farm to table meals, or I have a chef that comes in and helps me kind of depending on how many people are there, or if we have special events. And we serve produce that is grown on the farm or locally. There's a lot of amazing organic produce um, farmers in my area of Willow Creek, California. And um, we serve pork from pigs that we raise on the farm and eggs from our chickens. And we just try to make it this very um, wholesome and delicious you know, weekend or however many days you choose to stay. Um, and you get to really experience what life is like on a farm in the Emerald Triangle. Um, Walter, my husband, who is our main, um, you know, head cultivator, he takes everybody on a farm tour and explains a lot about all kinds of different aspects, you know, whether you want to find out about regenerative farming in general or how different cultivars perform or how he chose them or pest control or, you know, you just want to kind of see what a commercial cannabis farm is like and commercial I use because, you know, to me, it's commercial now. You know, we, we were very small for a very long time and we expanded a little bit during legalization. So to me, it seems like a lot but it's still only 10,000 square feet, which solidly qualifies us as a small farm. But we, um, you know, we also live on a wild and scenic river, the South Fork of the Trinity River. And there is amazing kayaking and whitewater rafting, both there and on the main stem of the Trinity. Um, and you can just go swimming in the river if that's what you prefer. But there is great hiking. The Trinity Alps are nearby. So you can make a whole outdoor adventure out of it. And, um, you know, of course, there's weed at a weed farm, too. Mm -hmm. And I love when you say glamping, like I encourage people to visit your all's website because you have some pictures on there of the tents and the setups. And it really is beautiful. Like it is as close to camping as you can get while still getting this incredible five-star tailored experience all around your farm and the surrounding area. Yeah, it's essentially camping, much more comfortable camping, and you don't have to bring anything but your clothes. So, Oh, and you're all just how you all have put it together too. I, I hope you take some credit for it. It really is like you're talking about these other places. Just to do this functionally on the cannabis farm and to also have the tours going. I really love it. I think more and more people are going to go the route that you're going where 
you don't just offer your weed, you offer the experience. Yeah, I mean, we started out uh, when we originally purchased this piece of property in 2001. You know, our whole goal really was to do permaculture uh, workshops and trainings there. And Mm -hmm. I also work in as sort of a, you know, in a healing capacity as a physical therapist with people with chronic pain. And so we had this vision of like, having a retreat center there, but we always kind of thought like, okay, well, we really love growing weed, but Mm -hmm. we obviously cannot invite people to come here while we're doing that, you know, back in the day. And um, so we always kind of thought like, okay, well, we're going to have to, to stop growing cannabis when we get around to having these guests experience. And then it became legal and we were like, sweet, we can actually incorporate the cannabis into it, which is what we obviously prefer because it is a part of our lives in every way. And I think it makes all things better. So, um, you know, we always wanted to share this experience with people and we're just super stoked that now we get to share the full spectrum experience And, um, you know, a big part of why we do it is because, you know, I feel that people in general, especially people who are living in really urban environments are suffering from like nature deficit disorder. Mm -hmm. And it really impacts you, you know, mentally and emotionally. And um, maybe you don't even notice it because you you just haven't connected with nature in so long. But when people come out, it is really amazing to watch them over the course of a few days, sort of just like kind of relax and get calmer. I mean, it is perfectly silent at our farm, except for you can hear the river, you know, flowing mm-hmm. by and sometimes a rooster crows, you know, so people who have to deal with a lot of ambient noise in their city life, you know, you don't realize how much stress that actually causes you until you don't have it there, you know, and so that I've found has been so cool. And we don't have any cell phone reception. So nobody can bother <laughs> you. And um, also just obviously the cannabis is involved in there as well, because, you know, you just can really, truly relax. And um, it's cool. It's like amazing to see the transformations that take place in people over like a three day period. And then the other piece of it is this educational piece of, you know, regenerative farming, Mm -hmm. if adopted globally could actually reverse climate change, right? Mm -hmm. So studies done by the Rodale Institute show that 111% of the carbon emitted through our all ways, driving, industrial farming, which is a huge one, electricity generation, all of those things, that if all farming was done regeneratively, we would sequester more carbon than we produce with all those activities. And so that part, it's like a true solution, right? But Mm -hmm. people don't really understand it. You know, it's a lot, it's a lot of information. And so to get to come and just sort of like experience it and be like, oh, I get it. You know, it's still farming. It's still a farm. You just slightly alter what you're doing to really focus on building the soil and 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 reducing your impact. And, um, you know, and I do feel that cannabis farming and, and regenerative cannabis farmers are at the forefront of this revolution. And so actually, you know, you can, to a small extent, kind of help reverse climate change by what weed you choose to smoke. Mm-hmm. And I think, like you said, what you choose, being able to inform the people who maybe might be interested in your weed and then come out or people that come out and then go back, giving them that time to really just let them see it. Because even apart from the people that might be coming out to a cannabis farm for the first time, I'm sure people who might be going out 
for the first or maybe even the second time to a farm or in particular a regenerative farm period, it's such a wonderful experience to let people have. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very enriching for us as well. And, you know, I guess that that makes me think that I want to bring up because it does come up sometimes is like a lot of people watched, you know, that that documentary that shall not be named on Mm -hmm. Netflix. Right. (laughs) And um, (laughs) and are kind of nervous to come out. Right. And, you know, this. Right. But it's, Mm -hmm. it's not like that. You know, it's not like that at all, especially at our place and our community of Willow Creek. It is not like that at all. There is no weird, sketchy vibe. You know, it is not dangerous, except that you might get stung by a bee or something like that. You know, like there is none of that. And it is really, it is a wholesome farm when you think of a, a farm you know, in Iowa and the white picket fence and all that, you know, whatever, Mm -hmm. like it, it's just like that, you know, it's a nice little family farm. And, and yes, we do grow a, a medicinal plant that you must be 21 to consume or 18 with a medical card. Um, (laughs) and, And, you know, but, but otherwise, like really everything that's going on there, it's sweet. It's nice. It's not weird at all. It is. It's very, easy to understand, very welcoming. And like you said, near some incredible nature as well. You are in a unique place. So while you're on the farm, while you're around all this, definitely take advantage of it. Were there any, apart from the main issue of legalization, are there any challenges right now that you run into that would could be made easier for you as a farmer or as someone providing this experience, things that could be changed to make it easier for you all to do this or do it in a new or different way? Well, absolutely. Yes. You know, it is very complicated to manage this, you know, and and I'm Mm -hmm. operating in somewhat of a gray area, right? As far as like, technically the glamping is a legally separate business from the farm. It is Mm -hmm. technically outside of our licensed premises. So according to the state, you know, the farm is mapped out on this thing and it's these, this part of the property and the glamping is outside of that. And so that's great because it allows me to let people smoke there, which, you know, technically you couldn't do within the licensed premises. Um, Unfortunately, I'm not able to sell my cannabis to my guests. Mm -hmm. I'm allowed to share cannabis from my personal garden with my guests, Um, but I, they can't purchase any of it to take home with them, which is really, really frustrating when you, when you think about the fact that you can go to a winery in Napa or Sonoma, Mm -hmm. you know, drink while you're there, get in your car, you know, buy more bottles of wine, get in your car, go drive around the windy roads of Napa. And that's all okay. But Mm -hmm. heaven forbid, you know, you would do the same thing with cannabis. So that, that part, I really hope they do change if we are able to get the ability to sell direct to consumer, which is being talked about you know, by the state right now, like allowing us a certain number of times a year that we could sell to customers directly. Um, That Mm -hmm. would be amazing. That would just be so great because that's what people want to do. You know, I've had so many people think showing up to come glamping that, oh, I'm going to be able to buy weed directly from the farmer. This is going to be so cool. And then they get there and they're disappointed. And I'm just like, I'm so sorry because I would love to be able to have you do that, you know? So Mm -hmm. that one's, that one's rough, you know, but I do see solutions to that coming. And as with everything in cannabis, particularly in California, you know, we just have to hold on. And eventually I do trust that it will work itself out and be reasonable. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think like you've said, it's a proven model that can work like with wineries, distilleries, alcohol in general, and some other things. You take a tour, you do a tasting, hey, exit through here, you can purchase what you liked. 
it's such a natural way to allow people to experience the farm and also provide for you as a farmer being able to sell your product and keep your margins as well and keep your quality too. If it never leaves the farm, you have control over your supply chain, right? Exactly. Yeah, that one's going to be a while yet. Right now, I think the way they're basically talking about it is that I would still jump through all the hoops, take it to a distributor, have them test it and package it. You mm-hmm. know, and then I would essentially have to somehow get it back from them to be able to sell it to people because they still want it to go through that whole chain of command thing. Um, But yes, um, ultimately, oh my gosh, that would be incredible to be able to just, and and also like once someone has come to visit and let's say they live in New York or something like that, I would very much like to be able to send them weed in the mail, you know, Mm -hmm. just like a wine of the month club or cigar of the month club or any of those other things that you can do, Um, you know, that, that will save Emerald Triangle Farmers right? If we can do that, we will all be okay, right? Because there are plenty of people in the world who live in other states and other countries that would very much like to have my Burmese mimosa. (laughs) And they can't have it right now, you know? So I really look forward to that day when we can just send it through the mail wherever to whomever appreciates it and wants to, you know, give me the value for it based on the rarity of this product, you know, like think about Mm -hmm. it. There are only so many places on the globe that you can grow outside in the sun. And so even though right now it's so strange to me that sun grown is devalued, right? Mm -hmm. Right now people are valuing indoor over sun grown over beyond organic craft sun grown And that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so we'll get there, you know, if we can make it through. But but that whole thing of like, this is a very finite resource. There is only so much of it and there's less of it every year right now, you know. And so California, all California farms, but in particular, small boutique artisan farms, you know, there is a market for that. Unfortunately, right now, we're just all kind of stuck with the current model. So, Mm -hmm. Well, it's like you said, the market is there. It's just allowing you to connect with your customers, especially directly. Like the demand is there. Your ability to grow is right there. You just need that little piece of paper, right? That's the Yeah, the freedom, the freedom to sell my product just like any other business. Exactly. And correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't there at least a suggestion, if not a proposal earlier this year from a couple of California representatives to tie that into descheduling where it would be a federal thing where USPS and everything like that would allow people to send up to, I think, half an acre? Um. There, it's called the SHIP Act, and mm-hmm. I believe it was put forward maybe by like an Oregon and a California, um, I can't remember if they were representatives or senators, but mm-hmm. yes, it essentially would allow, um, and, and what it, I can't, there is a limitation on size. Um, I am not sure what that was. I know at 10,000 square feet, we will definitely qualify. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, I'm like, yes. And, and it is, it is, it's allowing us to ship anywhere in the country. And I, as far as I understand it, like without going through a distributor, I think and hope that testing will still occur. I really do believe that the consumer deserves that, you know, and one thing that I think is going to be real interesting if we do get federal legalization in some form. It's Mm -hmm. like California has the most stringent testing standards, you know, and even though maybe that model is not perfect because it just right now is allowing for a little bit of shenanigans and stuff of people kind of THC shopping and stuff, and there aren't real good um, uh, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Like it's not standardized. Mm -hmm. And so there's issues that I'm sure they can sort out, but I just would like for the rest of the consumers and the whole rest of the country to benefit from really strict testing because exactly. it's kind of crazy what might be in your weed if you don't have that protection. A hundred percent. And it also just, like you said, get the value out of your product that you need. I think that like part of it is shortening that supply chain for you, like not having to take it to the distributor and processor and returning some of that value back to you, but just making that supply chain as short as possible. The interaction is you, the interaction is the customer and, you know, getting that lab testing, providing that protection to them. But in terms of extra hoops you need to jump through as a farmer to do basically the same thing, like simple is yeah. better, right? Way better. And the consumer will get cheaper weed ultimately, even if I make more on it, right? Because right now it's pretty horrible, you know, but if you went and bought a $40 eighth at a dispensary in California right now, the farmer is getting like three to five dollars of that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the state is getting 30%. The, the store is getting like 35, you know, mm -hmm. the distro's getting 20 of that, the testing, you know, like all of that. Like it's it is there is a lot of layers that make this not work for the farmer, you know? And, and I guess like, maybe that's true if you really look at farming of all things across our country, you know, pretty much all small farms, no matter what you grow, it's not set up to benefit the farmer, right? And, and the models that do work are kind of a direct to consumer like farmer's market model. Um, I don't know if you know who Joel Salatin is, Oh yeah, everything I want to do is illegal. I love him. And I love that title of that book because that happens to me all the time. Everything I do want to do is apparently illegal. And um, so, yes, so his model, you know, which is basically like he grows all of this and, um, you know, he directly markets it to his consumers. They mm -hmm. come pick it up, you know, and he makes it work. So, so um, yeah, it's, that's that's where I hope we get to with cannabis. And it helps your environmental concerns, too. If you don't have to take it and physically move it to the processor, to the distributor, even just in simple terms, less waste, less time in between. It just makes things efficient. Big time. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, so I just recently I was kind of doing some calculations because I I was thinking about like, oh gosh, I can't wait till I can send my weed to somebody in New York, you know, or mm -hmm. Florida or where at Texas, God help Texas. But, you know, <laughs> I, I hope someday they will get to have my weed. And, you know, the, I was like, wait a minute. Okay, wait, is it more environmentally sound to grow weed in the sun in California and send it to New York or is it actually more sound for them to buy indoor because they won't have that shipping? And we we kind of ran the numbers on it and it was like, oh yeah, it's still way more ecologically friendly to grow it in the sun and send it to mm -hmm. than it is to buy indoor. So I think eventually indoor, honestly, apart from genetic storage is going to phase out. I think eventually it's just going to become too expensive for all of the equipment and all of the real estate and things like that. Honestly, I think eventually it's just going to phase out and it'll be that weird period in time that people remember of, you remember when we did that thing and it was all, yeah, wasn't that crazy? I really hope you're right, Elijah. I love that. And I really, really hope that that turns out to be true because it is kind of insane what we're doing right now that all of these states as they are becoming legal these people are spending millions of dollars to set up these indoor situations and using a ton of energy like 
just in the growing, like don't even think about the build out or any of that stuff. I mean, it is nuts. And hello, we are, we are at a precipice. You know, we cannot Mm -hmm. keep doing this stuff. We're out of time. We have to turn it around right now. We can't be building new indoor warehouse grows in New Jersey right now or Illinois. Like that's nuts. When California destroyed hundreds of thousands of pounds of amazing weed last year mm-hmm. because it could not leave California. And in, you know, so it's just, it is so crucial that the feds get a clue and make it so we can move our stuff around the country because like no matter what else environmentally, this is a looming disaster, what we're doing right now. A hundred percent. It it feels obscene. Like, no, it but it's good that there are people like you. I I don't want to necessarily frame it in terms of doing the right thing because I can appreciate people making a living but doing something in a way that provides extra value, right? You don't just grow weed in the manner that makes sense or makes you feel the best, but everything involved in that is also helping, educating your consumers, giving people a chance to experience your community. Like you said, changing hearts and minds. Indeed. And, you know, I will say that while I personally feel very strongly that indoor cultivation, just from an environmental perspective, it is not the right thing to be supporting. Um, I do get it. I, I, I recently actually through the Gone GA program, which is how I met you, I met mm. this guy in Florida who is like a young young kid, like maybe, you know, in his early twenties. And he was talking to me about, he's a third generation indoor grower. And I was like, (laughs) mind blown because in my little bubble up here in the Emerald Triangle, of course, we have lots of multi-generational farms and farmers, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. But I was like, oh my gosh, that's right. Like in other places, people have totally been doing this for a long time indoors, you know, and they have a whole culture around that. And I would definitely not want to, you know, just be dismissive of that. I am speaking purely from an environmental perspective. And, you know, ultimately we all do live on this earth together and it will benefit all of us if we can figure out a way to to change this dynamic but but I do want to just give a nod to the folks who you know indoor is their art and hopefully we can figure out some way for them to still you know thrive but just also not be using up all of this these resources oh I think it'll be easy I think it'll be more like I think that once you stop the indoor i've had a lot of friends who've left indoor cultivation and feel an immense sense of relief as well just from the fact that like there are a lot of things they don't deal with like exhaust fans and led lights and wearing glasses inside like i think it'll be way easier than people think it'll be i think it's going to be fast i think once it happens it'll be three to five years and it'll be gone Although, like you said, the environmental concerns, all these warehouses are still going to be there. All that equipment still has been made. Yep, it's a complicated problem for sure. And growing up north, um, and I say north as like relevant to me, I'm only 40 minutes south of you all. Like, how do you all feel about like the changing seasons? I know you all said that the wildfires have been a concern, but have you noticed anything changing over the past, you know, two, three, five years longer? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So the fires are the most, you know, significant, obviously. And that's from this massive four year long drought that we've been having. And really, we even only had like maybe one good year of rain before that four years and then you Mm -hmm. go back and there was another several years of drought and so I would say that you know when we first moved to our farm in 2001 
you would have a real bad fire year with smoke that was, you know, just oppressive. Maybe once every four to five years. And, you know, for the past five years, it's been every year and it's been bad. Um, and it started the past two years, the first of August, which previously you could get through all of August and maybe half of September before you were really worried about it. So it's drier and it's drier quicker. Um, you know, we power our home on the farm with just, uh, um, we have a micro hydro generation in the creek. And so mm -hmm. up until two years ago, we never needed solar assistance. Uh, we only had the hydro and we had enough power to get through the year. Um, you know, we had to be careful at the end of summer when the creek was getting low, but we always could pretty much do whatever. Mm -hmm. And then two years ago, we went ahead and put like a thousand watts of solar panels on our roof because by the end of say July, it was like, oh, uh oh, the creek's too low. We're not getting enough power to run our house, you know? Mm -hmm. And then last year, because the creek was low and then it got so smoky that the sun wouldn't shine, that our solar panels didn't work um, or didn't produce enough with just a thousand watts. So then we added another bunch of solar panels this year. Um, and so, you know, I can tell just through those very specific things, you know, how much the climate is changing. And, you know, it's nerve wracking, like a lot of people in our Willow Creek community, you know, of course, the market is horrible. Um, and so there's that concern. But a lot of them have just decided to pack it in because they just don't feel they can't handle the fires and the stress of like every year being concerned that you're going to just lose everything because it's going to burn up in a wildfire. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of what we deal with, with cannabis is, you know, even though it's almost impossible for most homeowners in a lot of California to get any homeowners insurance that protects them against wildfire, you know, you add a cannabis farm on the property and you can forget about it. You know, mm -hmm. you are not getting insurance. And so it really is like, this is everything. This is everything we have. It's everything that we've built over our entire lives. And we literally could just be unlucky and lose everything, you know? Um, and that's just what you, it's a risk that you have to take on if this is what you're going to do. And, you know, so that I, we're doing everything we can, you know, we're doing forest maintenance. We're hoping to put in another pond this summer. You know, we live surrounded by national forest land. And so unfortunately that's completely out of our control what they do. And unfortunately they haven't been doing anything. So that's very um, stressful to be surrounded by this unmaintained national forest land um but basically you know it's i think everybody is dealing with it in their own way i think that really almost every single place in the united states has its own particular form of natural disasters that are getting worse you know um and ours happens to be wildfires and drought i mean that's certainly true like we were talking about everywhere is changing, but the wildfires in particular, I can see like just why they would be so crippling trying to like, especially with a farm, try and get any sort of insurance for that. Before I let you go, was there anything that you wanted to talk about? Anything you might want people listening to be educated on about as a small farmer or as a cannabis farmer? Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, we've talked about a lot of really good things so far. You know, I think that it's really great to know your farmer. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason why we offer the glamping is so that people can come out and meet us and see the farm. And so that then, you know, when they do go home and if they are in California and could go to a store and, 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 you know, buy soul spirit flower, they can be like, oh, I know who grew this and that they were doing it with my best intention or my best uh, experience in mind. 
And um, so if you have the opportunity wherever you live, because I actually just met some great small farmers from New York who are just getting up and going out there. And, and so, you know, hopefully as we go along, more and more places will have great, you know, sun grown to, to purchase that is local to them. So try to know your farmer. Uh, and with that goes for food just as much, you know, but um, mm-hmm. just try to support small farms. You know, there's, there's a lot in all of these states. Um, you know, there's big old money hungry corporations that have weed for sale on those store shelves and you can choose to buy that and give your money to the fat cats or you can choose to support a small farm that is healing the earth while they grow that is supporting communities that is you know tending to the land in a responsible way um, and that consumers ultimately are the most powerful people in the supply chain because they are the ones who decides what is going to be available. Mm. You do have a choice and you should utilize it. Yes. And, you know, if you want to come see what you would be supporting, if you purchased Soul Spirit products, you can come out to the farm and come hang out with us for a little while and have a great nature experience. Absolutely. And what's your website and your social media and things like that, like for people that do want to come and explore and maybe come out to the farm? Absolutely. So um, if you go to soulspiritfarm.com, so it's just S-O-L, like the sun, Mm soulspiritfarm.com. That is our farm website where you can find out all about our farming practices and our products and Um, The retreats website, so it's soulspiritretreats.com, is the booking site for the glamping. Mm -hmm. And then um, our social media uh, is the same. So on Instagram, it's at Soul Spirit Farm and at Soul Spirit Retreats. And those are the best ways to get in touch with us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for talking to me today, Judy. And I can't wait to try some of that Burmese mimosa. Yeah, we will. I will let you know as soon as it's out in the market. Thank you so much, Judy. You have a good one today. You too, Elijah. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Bluegrass Podcast. If you'd like to check out more episodes, you can do so at bluegrasscannabis.com. If you'd like to stay up to date with news, merch, and more, Make sure to follow us on Instagram at bluegrass underscore cannabis, TikTok at bluegrass cannabis, Twitter at bluegrass canna, the bluegrass podcast, old fashioned, all natural, Kentucky bluegrass.